Welcome to Real Estate Real World, where we talk to the movers, shakers, and leaders that are getting it done right now in the real estate industry and beyond. I'm your host, Marguerite Crespillo, and I started this podcast simply dedicated to calling people about what's really happening in this crazy roller coaster ride of real estate. Be sure to subscribe on iTunes and stay up to date on the newest stuff by adding yourself to the list at www.realestaterealworld.com. Now, let's dive into the world of real estate. Hello, hello. This is Marguerite Crespillo, and welcome to another edition of Real Estate Real World, where we get to talk to all the cool people. And today, we have a very special guest. Cody Gilkison is the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Leader for EXP Realty, as well as the Staff Chairman of One EXP. Being born and raised in the Deep South led him to experience a wide range of discrimination, both as a witness and a target, which drew him to search for a career where he could have an impact against these kinds of words and actions. While working in the banking sector, he had the opportunity to hear his hero, Amber Hikes, speak, and that moment was the spark he needed to fully commit to doing DEI work full-time. He credits EXP for giving the opportunity to walk in his calling and is now in his self-described dream job. Cody is passionate about community involvement, finding commonalities, and showcasing underrepresented voices. Hosting EXP's official DEI podcast, EXP Culture Cast, gives him constant opportunity to grow and learn from folks from all walks of life, and he's thrilled to share that journey with all of you. Cody now lives with his husband in small town, Illinois. Welcome, welcome, Cody. Hey, it's great to be here. Yes, I'm so excited to talk to you. We were in some groups and stuff was going on. I was like, we need to have him on the podcast. So here you are. (laughs) I appreciate it. So tell me a little bit about your background. You talked a little bit in your bio of having challenges in your own life. Uh, right. growing up, I would assume, and and what that might have looked like that has brought you into this dream job. Yeah, I grew up in a, at a really small town in Georgia called Barnesville, Georgia. Um, if you look at a map of Georgia, it's the dead center of Georgia. It also is dead. So <laughs> it's an apt <laughs> comparison. In Barnesville, I grew up as an adopted child and came into my sort of queer identity young, right? There's some people who realize really early and you can't put that cat back in the bag and the community did not respond well to it including my parents and my parents were my adopted parents i'm talking about were really absent in my life a lot i was sort of raised by a nanny in a nanny's household which also led me to another getting to view another side of the world because i grew up in a pretty racist area in a black household Right. And then I would come home and my parents would try to deprogram me from all the stuff that I learned. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) That is a family of another race. It was a wild experience. Yeah. And then I came out of the closet to my mom when I was 13 and it didn't go well. She attempted to give me an ultimatum of go to conversion therapy or don't live under my roof anymore. So I was homeless for a while, sort of couch surfing with friends who had more understanding parents until I got to college. And in college, I was able to live in my truth and be open and and adapt and grow in a way that I experienced what most people would experience uh, as a child and a teenager in my late teens and early 20s. And the discrimination that I faced even there in a more liberal city in South Georgia and Valdosta, where I went to college. And going to a liberal arts school for, I I got my bachelor's degree in musical theater, which I'm, you can see me using every day, right? (laughs) But it was a great experience to inundate myself in queer culture and really got me on a path of learning what got the queer community where it is now. I dug into that sort of history that we don't get taught in schools consider myself an expert on that subject and I go around and folks who haven't been able to learn those lessons from some of our queer icons and and, and folks in the past historical so let figures. Me, let me ask you this. 
Can you give us the time frame? So when you were in college, was how many years ago? What years were those? I was in college from 03 to 08. So it's interesting because I just turned 60 in November. And I grew up in a very small town called Chico in, in Northern California. And what's interesting is I had an, my uncle Tony when I was growing up, who I saw randomly, very rarely, but I saw him a few times. And I went to live with him when I was 22 to get out of town. And I literally don't ever remember having any conversation about any gay person anywhere. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget talking to my mom. And my mom was very embracing and open to that. And I said, mom, I go, I'm really confused about Uncle Tony. <laughs> He's got tons and tons of guy friends around here, but he doesn't <laughs> really have any girlfriends. And my mom goes, oh, honey, he's gay. And I said, what does that mean? <laughs> like, and I was 22. I didn't know. Yeah. So, of course, I love, loved my Uncle Tony, but we're talking, this was in 1980, probably 84. Mm. And the tragedy at that time, and I haven't really talked about this story publicly, but the tragedy at that time was this is around the time when AIDS had come out. Mm -hmm. And my Uncle Tony's partner was a high up political official here in the Sacramento area. And my uncle Tony got beat up in a bathroom in the Dallas, Texas airport. And what that did is it caused, he apparently he'd already tested, been positive for AIDS, but it exacerbated the AIDS at that time. So my uncle started having, was basically in this isolated room in a hospital in Dallas. And my uncle's partner couldn't publicly go there to take care of him. Right. And so here I am 22 years old. They fly me to Dallas to go get my uncle Tony. And that's when I learned the whole world and how significant discrimination was. Because again, I was extremely naive and not just because of where I grew up. And the times right. too were very different. I mean, right. definitely you didn't talk about those things back in right. you know the 70s and 80s. And so it became this whole thing of trying to get my uncle care. And at this time, the hospitals weren't even prepared to take on AIDS patients and they refused treatment to him. Mm -hmm. It was like this long, long nightmare. And luckily, I felt blessed that I was able to take care of him until he passed away in 1988. Mm -hmm. But that was my eye opener to the gay community and the gay world and what was going on. And people were horrible then. I don't know if you were probably young at that point, but at that point, people were, it was, oh, they deserve it. And they, all this kind of stuff, right. For being gay. It was that AIDS was basically God's way of clearing the gay oh, yeah. population. You know, all of this, but it was just, it was so shocking to me. And I feel really blessed that I never saw that as okay. Like right. from growing up with my mom and I never saw any of that as okay. And so it was really sad how all the stuff that happened at that time, mm -hmm. the blessing yeah, was I mean, that opened the doors to a lot more inclusion. Obviously a lot has changed dramatically since my uncle passed away in 88. Thank God. It has, yeah. And it's a, a rare thing with the queer community where it's a community that has always existed in the background, in the shadows, and the first real time most people remember queer stories being all over the news is the AIDS epidemic, which is not a great coming out story for a community, no. right? And AIDS is not a death sentence anymore. It's not what it used to be, Thank but goodness. at the time, it this is part of the reason why I believe so wholeheartedly in queer storytelling, because most of the people who were there to tell those stories aren't with us anymore. Yeah. We lost a big, giant portion of our community before we even knew they were part of our community, before we could even really come together before the internet. I Similarly, I have an uncle, Alan, who was the only sort of queer person I ever knew when I was a kid, but he was very rarely around. He was like my aunt's brother, and I never really saw him, but he was diagnosed with HIV in the 90s, and um, he's still alive today. But it was always that everybody held their breath when he was going to be around. Yeah. Right. It is interesting because you say how much it was in the background. And again, I think back to my childhood growing up, like my great grandmother had this 
they were clearly a gay couple. They had lived together. They were friends. They were just best friends and they had lived together for 40 years. And it always was that sort of background thing and assimilation. So even back in the day in the 60s and the 50s and the 40s and the 30s, there were organizations of gay men that were trying, but the, the thought process then in the early movement, there was a society called the Mattachine Society. And their thought process was, we're going to be as politically vanilla as we can, as palatable as we can, and try to convince the world that we're normal, that we're the same as everyone else, that we have one minor difference and that's it. And they didn't really push for gay rights. They really took a very placid, flat attitude towards things. And they got a lot of pushback from that, which sort of is the creation point of gay subculture, where you would see stuff coming up in the 60s. And and then we it, it culminates in Stonewall, right, with the drag queens and the transgender folks and people of color and the Christopher Street Liberation March, where there's men in their underwear marching around. This is the opposite of the Mattachine Society, but that came as a result of being discriminated against and held down as a community. And then the only vocal voice of the community was this men in three-piece suits not saying anything important, right? Which then was further exacerbated by the AIDS epidemic, where then people really started to see you. I mean, you could have heard of Stonewall back in the day if you paid attention, but you couldn't avoid the AIDS epidemic on the news. And when that came out, it became, we're more than this disease, but it's hard to share that message while we're fighting for our lives, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting because so much of this has happened in my generation. So much has happened to allow more equality into it. And it's obviously we've come a long way. But we obviously have a long ways to go. Like today, for example, I think about this and it today's the day we're recording is not when we'll air, but the day we're recording today is March 1st. And it's the first day of Women's History Month. Mm -hmm. And I think about how far women have come in addition to this. And still quite a few more glass ceilings to break through with women, though. We're not fully there yet. Yeah, Yeah. we've got it. We've got a ways to go. Mm -hmm. But I feel so blessed to be here during this time when things are much more inclusive in a lot of ways. Again, like I said, we still obviously have a lot of work to go. And and I live in Northern California, so I feel like we're a lot more open to things than maybe other parts of the country. And we're much more inclusive. I live an hour from San Francisco and there's a lot more progress I feel we've made here than maybe Mm -hmm. other parts of the world. But I guess I just like, I I love to hear like what you've been through and what you've gone through to get to where you are and how that's impacting things now. Because I would venture to say that 20 years ago, there was not even a title at most companies of senior manager of diversity, equity, and inclusion. (laughs) That Um, wasn't even a position that anyone is considering. And I do believe EXP has been on the forefront of doing a lot of these things to make sure that people's voices are heard. Yeah, and it's true. And this thing, diversity, equity, and inclusion, has gone through a number of reskins, reframings, rewordings, kind of thing. The DEI is where we are now. It's going to change in the future. We think we know what it's going to change to, hopefully. But this used to be what was called CSR, corporate social responsibility. That came up in the '90s and in caught on. But again, it was something that was testing the waters. And some companies, if they were doing it, they were visibly doing it and everybody knew it, right? Companies that had good corporate social responsibility that I think of in those early days are like Patagonia. And you think about the shoe brands that are around today, like Tom's or the sock brand Bombas that gives back, right? But that corporate social responsibility, the, the game playbook used to be in order to show we're good social citizens as corporate entities, we write a lot of checks to charity. But there's more to it than that. There's something about employees' sense of culture, employees' sense of belonging that can make an attraction element for your company that is more powerful than most other things, including salary. And I think we're getting to the point now, the tipping point at the younger millennials 
and the Gen Z and particularly Gen Alpha is they are looking for this type of thing that I do. And if the company doesn't do it, they're not interested because the thought process is if a company doesn't have these programs, particularly employee resource groups, like the resource groups we have in 1EXP, if the company doesn't have these, where am I going to fit in? That's the way that they feel, right? They've become integral to be uh, a, a viable corporation that employees find value in. And I definitely agree with that 100%. Like I said, in talking a little bit about Women's History Month, there's such a lack of diversity at the leadership level. It's true. That in most companies, not only in having women at those levels, but having variety of color and sexual orientation and whatever it is mm -hmm. that is also needs to be represented at leadership. Because I'll never forget Oprah telling a story when she was a little girl and she saw a black woman on TV for something or somewhere. And she said that was the first time she felt like she could do that because now she saw someone who looked like her representation. Yeah. And it's still a, an ongoing battle for everyone, but to be able to see, I know that even when we're doing events now, we're much more conscientious of thinking, okay, who are we going to put on stage and how does that, stage reflect the audience? Do we have people of color there? Do we have people of different orientations? Do we have these different people on our panels? And that's becoming more prevalent, which it has not been. And I'm mm. excited about that. I'm excited that right. we're having those conversations that we've not had before. And even a couple of years ago, I remember seeing something, some event we were going to, and it was all white guys on the stage, right? Mm -hmm. And we're like, okay, where's the rest of the world, right? Yep. Oh, we didn't even, we weren't even paying attention. We didn't realize it. I go, well, that's the problem. You weren't paying attention and you didn't realize that you didn't think about it because it doesn't impact you. You only think about it if it impacts you, right? Right. Yeah. And sometimes you have to take that opportunity and pass it on to someone else who is more represented. I, I think all the time, about a couple of years ago, I was invited to speak in a Juneteenth panel. No. You can find a person of color to speak on Juneteenth. I promise you can find one. I can help you if you'd like. But no, I'm not going to be on that stage. Doesn't that, that uh, seem to be an excuse a lot? Oh, we don't have anybody that's, you're like, come on. You do. Like, you I do. just had this conversation in a Facebook group. This was pretty interesting. And they said it was something about lack of women in, in leadership or lack of women in something. And they're like, why does it even have to be whether it's a woman or a man or black or white or yellow? Why does it even have to be? Can't we just choose the person with the with the most, most experienced, right. most qualified? You're telling me that out of 180,000, 86,000 agents at that other particular company, you could not find any women qualified to sit on that panel. When yeah, and you know what? I would take that a step further. I would take that a step further and say that if you don't know of any qualified women, maybe it's time to make one. I love that. Yes. Right? If in your eyes, that. you don't know any women that are on this stage, put one on the stage. And then next time you'll remember her. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's, it. That, that's the best response I've heard so far that I love that because that's true. You don't see outside your bubble. I think sometimes you don't see outside right. your little world and you don't see what other opportunities and potential are there. Right. And, so, and representation absolutely matters. Like you told the story about Tim Cook, right? I, I remember as a kid seeing Elton John or Ellen DeGeneres, or we didn't have a lot of icons back then, but anybody like that was on screen and I was glued, right? That's why what I wanted to be as a kid was an entertainer because the only queer people I had ever seen were entertainers, yeah. right? And it wasn't even talked about then. I think the whole yeah. world knew that Elton was clearly gay and many of the, many of the yeah. celebrities, but it was not talked about. It was a taboo mm -hmm. subject. You can go way back into Hollywood. I'm trying to think of the actor's name. I can't think of him where they, he had an arranged marriage, so to speak, mm -hmm. so that it was never questioned. But I, I'm, I do feel, like I said, like we've made a ton of progress, but we definitely have some way to go. So what is your official job? What is it that you do for EXP? What does that your title mean? So my title entails, we put on events, pretty 
constantly at a constant pace. I host a podcast, of course, that consolidated a lot of event creation because rather than me doing a bunch of fireside chats, now I just have everybody on my podcast. That made the world of difference. But the bulk of what I do before the DEI department was started, EXP's official diversity, equity, and inclusion project was 1EXP. And 1EXP is our collection of resource groups formerly called affinity groups, but we call them resource groups now to align with that corporate culture of employee resource groups. We just don't say employee because it's also for agents, right? They're primarily for agents. If you look at the makeup of our company is 90,000 agents and 2,200 staff, they're for agents, right? (laughs) But so we manage those groups and make sure they're putting out good content and helping them with event production and being added to the communications plans and all that business managing their budgets, and also reviewing when people have an idea for a new group that's something that isn't covered already by 1EXP. Then we help them build those groups from the roots up, right? We've, since I started, we've built four now new resource groups from the Climate Action Network to the Healthy Mind Collective And now the newest ones are EXP Capable, which is for folks with disabilities and their allies and friends and families. And the EXP Indigenous Network for people that are indigenous to to any land, right? Native Americans and First Nation Canadians and Aboriginal um, Australians and and all kinds of those folks with those backgrounds. Now that EXP is international, right? We're in like, what, 27 countries, I think? Yeah, I think it's 27. That sounds right, yeah. Yeah. And actually, I'm going to have Michael Valdez on the podcast in a few weeks. Ooh, I'm excited about that. He was that. my yeah. original boss. He's the guy that lifted me up to this position. Was he? Yeah. Oh, yeah sure. I love him. He's one of my favorite people on the planet. Yeah. Yeah. To be honest with you, and this is a story that I tell that sometimes they don't love it when we tell stories about something bad that happened at EXP, right? But in my story, I started at EXP as a transaction coordinator kind of role, right? As an auditor for, for transaction co- coordinators. And I've always done DEI work as a volunteer through all of my different career paths that I've been on. I've always been a volunteer for different queer organizations within the companies I've worked at. Um, and I wanted to join the Pride Network, the EXP Pride Network, which is our LGBTQ organization. And look, I've led a national version of one of these. I think I could be a a great voice to help propel this thing forward. And EXP told me, no, you can't join. Those groups are for agents. And I said, I'm sorry, that is discrimination. And I was loud about it and vocal about it. And I was like a bulldog and would not let it go and had meeting and meeting and meeting and meeting with the people team and the, the HR folks. And eventually they said, I think we need to invest in a department and Michael Valdez saw the drive that I had and heard the arguments that I made and said, you should just fix this problem. I love that. Right. That's where I wound up where I am. I finally am being paid to do the work that I've been doing (laughs) at the 40 to 50, 50 to 60 hour range of my, you know, (laughs) but now it's the full-time gig. Right? Michael's an amazing leader, and that does not surprise me that he pushed for that and backed you in that. He's an extraordinary human being. He's one of my favorite a, people on the planet. He's a titan of this company. I wish I had a quarter of his energy and his chutzpah, you know what I mean? Me too. Like, I see him running around with an assistant, trying their hardest to keep behind him at EXP Con or shareholders, and I'm like, I don't have the energy in my body. <laughs> And he always looks amazing, does he not? He always like, he smells good. Always dressed. <laughs> He's, yeah. I'll have to tell him how we were bragging on him on this episode. Yeah. <laughs> it's one of my it's one of my favorite people, and he still has a hand. He's not my manager anymore. I'm now in the people team officially with old Mike with Mike Bain, who I love, and I think Michael still has a big hand. He's the cor- the corporate sort of executive sponsor of One EXP. He's one of the original framers of EXP, along with Glenn and Fee Gentry. And he has high-level budget approval over the corporate partnerships that we have, like the partnership that we have the ARIA, with ARIA and the LGBTQ plus Real Estate Alliance and with NAREP and NAREB. He's our key ambassador for all of those relationships, honestly. It's good stuff. So what is coming up for you? What's next for your division, your department? Is there anything exciting that you have going on? Yeah, I mean, it's Women's History Month. 
So we just got done with Black History Month, which was monumental. One of the things we've got going on is our company operates out of a, a, a virtual workplace. Like we had EXP World. Now we're moving into this new version, which is called Frame. And with us moving over, we have always had these sort of heritage experiences where you could go in and learn a little bit about whatever the month we're celebrating is. We tore down all those in EXP World and we're rebuilding them from scratch and frame with all the new assets and stuff like that. And now the beauty of it is you don't have to have a pass to get in. Anybody can type in the website and go and see these experiences. And the Black History Museum was so inspiring to create. It, every time I worked on an exhibit, even the stories that I did know, it's like I put them on the wall and I know that people are going to see this. And it gave me this feeling I've never had before. And if I thought that was inspiring... This Women's History Museum that just went live today is just magnificent. Me working with Morgan Johnson on my team, this thing, I'm so proud of this thing. We've got a lot going on for Women's History Month. We've got several. I didn't even months. know that was in EXP World. I just started getting in there. Now I'm so excited to go in there and see it. Yeah, for anybody that wants to go see it, you can see either of those. To get in there, all you got to do is exp.world, and then you can do slash Black History Library or slash Women's History Museum. Either oh of those God. experiences you can go and look at today. That is so cool. It's really so if great. If you want to see it, you can go check it out. You can reach out to either of us, or you can actually just go to exp.world. Black History Library or Women's History, History Museum. Okay. And yep. you can go inside EXP World and check it out. That's amazing. Because I remember a few years ago, I went to, my sister lives in Alexandria, Virginia. So we went back there and went through the Smithsonian. And I was speechless almost the entire time going through both the Black History section of the Smithsonian and the Women's History section of the Smithsonian was incredibly powerful. So yeah. I'm excited to go in and see this inside EXP World. Yeah, it's great. And, and the Women's History Museum, we even gave a special shout out to the women of EXP that I think is a really powerful moment of founders of our different 1EXP resource groups who are women as well as current leadership who are women. And I'm happy to say that at EXP, our 1EXP resource groups, all 14 of them, it's 76% female. Wow. The leadership. And that number is about to go up on Monday. We're bringing another one in. So, so you said there are 14 gr resource, resource groups. groups. Can you name yep. them all off? Oh, my gosh. Off the top of my head. I can do my very best. Oh my gosh. If I leave anybody out, they're going to be so mad. I should probably just pull up a list. So and, and let's read it off because I'm genuinely curious. I don't even know what all those resource groups are, but I'm inspired. Yeah, most people don't. That's the thing. In the company, we have that. Yeah. Okay. So starting from the top, we have the EXP Asian Network. That one is, is great. It's run by Garrick Yan and Huey Wynn. Then you can move down and we have the new ones that I talked to you a minute about for the Climate Action Network, which puts on a ton of great information about green homes and how agents can use their superpowers to change the world for the better using green technology. The EXP Healthy Mind Collective, because I think mental health could not be more important at the moment, particularly for real estate agents experiencing burnout and depression and all of that business. Then we have the EXP Young Professionals Network. That's both for people under 40 and for new agents, young in the profession as well. And I tell everybody that group is not just for, all of our groups are open for anyone. Young professionals in particular, if you are someone who is over 60 and you think that you don't have anything to learn from a millennial or a Gen Z, I would beg you to go to one of their Friday, yeah, Monday, yeah, Friday Mastermind mind meetings. They have mastermind meetings with people from all the kind of different backgrounds that, I mean, these will make you an icon. Yeah. Period. Then on the other side of that, we have the EXP Seniors Network, led by a really talented, really devoted crew. That's a group where you can go in and drop a question and you'll have 36 people answering you within the hour. They are devoted, right? That's a great group. Then we have EXP Latino, led by some of our real alpha agents. That's a powerhouse of a group that has bet. a real sense of community. We have EXP Middle East. Um, we're currently looking for leadership for EXP Middle East. That one's kind of, we've yet to identify who is going to be able to take the reins of that group, but 
We do have it and they are active and we do put on events for them. We're just on the lookout. We also have EXP Military Network, which is gigantic. EXP Military Network has state squads in every state and some international squads as well. They also have a major presence for military spouses, which is huge. And military spouses are one of those untapped markets for agent attraction that people don't think about, right? No. They have, I mean, these women with their husbands deployed have all the time in the world and want to do some good. And that's a, a key demo for, for agent attraction, for real. Um, and then we have the EXP Pride Network that we talked about, the LGBTQ network. That one also has brand new leadership that are young and hungry and ready to go do do some damage. We have EXP South Asian, which differentiates from Asian because we're talking about India and the Philippines and those countries, which are culturally very different. Asia is a big place with a lot of different cultures, right? So they're split out in those two groups. And uh, be remiss not to mention the Black EXP Network, or otherwise affectionately known as BEN. BEN's marquee project is the Agent Accelerator Academy, which is the most profound path to ICON that we offer. And it's open to more than just Black agents. And one of the great things about it is it's that intrinsically Black experience of storytelling and oral tradition, because if you graduate from the Agent Accelerator Academy next year, you're the teacher of the Agent Accelerator Academy mm. and so on and so, so forth ad infinitum. So everybody learns. It's that yeah. climbing while uh, well leading kind of thing. Um and then the two new ones are EXP Capable, which we mentioned for folks with disabilities and their parents and loved ones and friends, and the EXP Indigenous Network for people of Indigenous communities from all over the world. I Those love it. Cool. Yeah. I had no idea. I've learned a whole lot today. I knew that there was a lot going on, but I wasn't really clear on all these different resources. Every day I'm finding out new and incredible information for all of this. Yeah. So, and you may notice that one group is really not mentioned, and that's because we are under construction and in the process. We've been building in the background for almost a year and a half now. And in March for Women's History Month, we will be launching the all new EXP Women's Impact Network which is going to be the powerhouse of powerhouses. Obviously, real estate agents are 65% female. So this group is going to be big. And the reason that we didn't just go ahead and open it, we are really stocking the shelves before we open this door. This thing is going to have some serious value for our female agents when we open the doors later this month. I'm very excited about that one. All of them, of course, but I'm excited about that one. So let me know how I can help or what I can do to participate in that one. Of that course. Yeah. yeah. Well, Cody, this has been an eye-opening conversation. I knew it would be. And thank you so much for taking the time to be here and help us be much more embracing and accepting of all differences, of all people in the world. At the end of the day, love is love. Well, thank you so much again for being here. I really appreciate it. And thank you, everybody, for joining us again on Real Estate Real World. Be sure to follow us all of our social channels and subscribe and share with your friends. It helps us get up in the ranking. And on a side note, our podcast was just recently picked up by the all new EXP REO on air, <laughs> I radio, and it's I'm the radio. voice of the commercials. If you recognize this voice, <laughs> I know, I know. So I'm so excited. We were our show was picked up, so we'll be on in this conversation. We'll be on the radio, so I'm excited about that. So again, yep, you can oh my catch God. my show EXP Culture Cast on KGCI Radio too. We were picked up in the first round as well. We're on That's Fridays exciting. in the 9 a.m. block. I think I'm on Mondays at 8 p.m. is what I was told, but I've also been okay. told that they're moving the schedule around That's a lot, so not to be committed to that specific time, but right. I was really excited that they launched yesterday, so it's, it's exciting. So, Again, thank you, everybody, for joining us on Real Estate Real World. Go out and make it an amazing day. Thank you for joining us today on Real Estate Real World, where we talk with masters and leaders in the real estate industry and beyond on how we can raise the bar in our industry. Please subscribe over on iTunes, and while you're there, be sure to give us a review. Your reviews encourage us and help others to find our podcast for show notes and hot topics on what's going on right now in our real estate industry. Also, hop on over to www.realestaterealworld.com and add your name to our email to get early advance notice of upcoming podcasts. Thanks again for listening and go out there and be a part of the elite masterclass and raising the bar on the real estate industry.